Pat, you ready? Yep. Okay, we will open the Historic Preservation Commission meeting uh, with the City of Davenport for April 11th. Uh, may we have a call of order, please? McGivern? Present. Franken? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Powers? Yes. Hastetti? Here. All right, we have a quorum, so it takes us to the sec uh, Secretary's report. We have consideration of the March 14th, 2023 meetings and minutes. I have a recommendation from the Commission. Second. I got a motion and a second to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that's passed. Item number three, communications. Matt? Um, unfortunately, Commissioner uh, Higgins has stepped down, so we do have another vacancy. Okay. But we will have another commissioner that was it's set for appointment on Wednesday, so we'll, we'll only be down to six, but... So let us know if you have anybody. Um, it can be male or female uh, at this point because we'll have three of three males, three females. Thank you very much. All right. Sorry to hear that. That takes us to uh, item number four, old business, case number C zero A twenty three dash ten, request for exterior alteration at seven fourteen Gain Street. The Postal Rental House is a contributing building in the Hamburg Local Landmark Historic District. Mays is the petitioner. Yeah. Okay, so the commission uh, reviewed this project at its March meeting. Uh, this is a homeowner that's received financing through the DREAM project. Uh, the house was built in 1895, currently has an asphalt roof with aluminum siding, wood windows, and a stone foundation. Uh, it's located on Gaines Street, uh, just north of 7th Street along the alley. So to recap uh, the March 14th meeting, uh, the commission approved the installation of five new windows as they were presented. Uh, and then the commission uh, approved the replacement of the rear entry door uh, subject to the following, that an alternative door uh, be selected by the petitioner that better resembled the design pattern or material of the existing door and for that to be reviewed and approved by staff. So the last remaining item uh, for this application uh, pertains to the porch. So that was voted to be tabled on at the March 14th meeting. Uh, the purpose for that was to provide the applicant with additional time to select building materials and to clarify construction details. Uh, so to summarize the conversation at the March meeting, uh, the commission provided the following comments. Uh, they were supportive of the PVC column porch columns if the massing scale size and visual appearance was consistent with the existing square columns of the porch. Uh, the commission was not opposed to the composite decking floorboards. However, a suggestion was made to select boards without the wood grain finish. Uh, the commission suggested floorboards be installed in the same orientation as the existing flooring. And then finally, the commission wanted further clarification on the material, style, and dimensions of the porch railings and balusters and that uh, to the greatest extent possible, select products that match the proportions and dimensions of the existing material. Um, so with that, uh, the applicant has selected uh, or is continuing to select the composite decking with the floorboards to be installed in the same orientation as the existing porch flooring. Um, so on the right, you could see um, images of the current flooring. So the floorboards are perpendicular um, at the front of the house, and then it wraps around the side where they become parallel. Uh, so the applicant would use this evidence to install the new floorboards in that similar uh, layout. The porch column, uh, they've selected Craftsman classic square non-tapered smooth column with the standard capital and base. This was identified because it was a product that closely resembled the existing porch columns, which were square, um, non-tapered porch columns. So that image on the right is the uh, proposed design. And then the baluster. So on the left, you have the existing baluster design as well as lattice. And then on the right is the proposed, it's called Radiance Rail Express Baluster Pack. They've selected a white design. So at last meeting, there were some questions whether they were going to do a metal 
railing design. They've selected this um, baluster pack because it does have that rectangular finish in white to kind of closely replicate, at least visually, uh, those existing balusters. Um, so here are some existings of the existing porch in its condition, so we can reference those for discussion. So based on the feedback provided by the commission at the March meeting, staff recommend approval of the certificate of appropriateness to reconstruct the front porch in accordance with the submitted material. Uh, staff reviewed the project for conformance with the historic preservation ordinance, and it generally meets uh, the following standards. Um, that reasonable efforts should be made to make the minimum changes necessary to maintain the property in good state of repair, and that um, where the severity of deterioration requires replacement, the new feature matches the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and where possible, materials. Thank you, Matt. Commission? Questions? No, I had one. Would you please no. put your mic on? Thank you. I noticed that, um, in the, at least in the pictures that you showed this week, that they still had the grain in the way. And I know you can get it without the grain, so I just was puzzled why they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I spoke with the contractor on that note and highlighted that comment from the March meeting. Um, his response back was that the grain of the floorboards helps with traction and footing. Oh, okay, um, so it might be a safety issue with children. Potentially, yes. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else from the commission? I need a recommendation, please. I would like to go ahead and move that we approve the certificate of appropriateness uh, to reconstruct the front porch in accordance with the submitted material. There's a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Franken? No. Miranda? Yes. Powers? Yes. Pastetti? Yes. McGivern? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Takes us to new business, number five. Uh, case number COA 23-15, request for exterior alteration of 436 West 7th Street. The Alexander and Frederick uh, Tank Nikhil House is a contributing uh, building in the Hamburg Local Landmark Historic District. Midwest Complete Construction is the petitioner. Matthew? Okay, so this is another applicant that has received uh, financing through the Dream Project. Um, this home was built in 1898. It's a Queen Anne and also resembles a four square uh, style of architecture. So significant features of the property is it has a wraparound porch, a cubicle form, but that southeast corner uh, is curved and it does have decorative windows at the second and then attic level. Uh, so building materials, it has an asphalt roof with wood siding, one over one wood windows, and it sits on a stone foundation. It's currently used as a single family home. So this uh, house is located on 7th Street, uh, just north of where Scott Street terminates. Um, so the scope of the project, um, first being to replace a deteriorated mud beam that's located at the rear of the home. So the applicant would repair and replace the mud beam uh, with a similar material. The mud beam's a, a support that sits on the foundation of the home to which then the structure gets built off of. So it's important that that be uh, sound structurally to have a level foundation and footing. Uh, the second component is to uh, install new crown molding at areas we're missing. Uh, the replacement cedar boards will be milled to match those that they're replacing. Uh, the third component is to replace siding with cedar lap siding um, in several select areas where it's deteriorated. Uh, that would be where the dormer meets the roof line at the front of the home. Uh, missing, there's missing siding at the bottom of the west side of the home near the PVC exhaust. Uh, third would be to replace missing siding at the east side of the home behind the porch. And then lastly, um, to replace select areas when they're out there. Um, that required replacement. And then finally, uh, they would repaint the house, so that would include uh, cleaning, scraping, sanding, priming the wood, and apply paint. 
so these photos show the existing condition. That photo on the right uh, shows the state of the mud beam and its uh, current state, which has some deterioration. You could see too the siding um, is in need of a repaint and a refinish. Um, just some more images of the siding and some of that trim material that's found on site. And these are images of the porch. Um, so with that, staff is recommending approval uh, for exterior alteration as uh, proposed in the Certificate of Appropriateness. Uh, once again, it was reviewed for conformance with our standards of historic preservation. So it meets the following standard that every reasonable effort shall be made to make the minimum number of changes necessary to maintain the property in a good state of repair and minimizing impacts of proposed alterations. Thank you. Is the petitioner here? If you would like to uh, address the commission, you're more than welcome to, uh, not necessary. But if you do, you need to step forward to the podium. It does seem to spell it out. The house was refurbished in 1976 and by, uh, it was used as a halfway house for adults and uh, not really restored, but refurbished. They used a lot of Bondo and things for some of the repairs. And so some of that has rotted out and, and, and he's, I'm redoing that with wood epoxy. Um, but that's not in the scope of that. That was of this. That's something I was doing myself. Is with some of the some of the window details, which I'll do the windows. But this is the rest of it. Yeah. Beautiful property. Thank you. Yeah. Does the commission have any questions for the petitioner? Thank you, sir. Commission, any questions uh, for staff? If none, I need a recommendation. I recommend that we approve the certificate of appropriateness as stated. Second. I have a motion and a second for approval. Roll call, please. Hastetti? Yes. McGivern? Yes. Franken? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Powers? Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, that takes us to case number COA 23-18. Uh, Request for the exterior alteration of 225 East 2nd Street. The John F. Kelly Building is a locally listed historic landmark uh, in the Davenport Motor Row and Industrial Historic District. Uh, Davenport, Historical, Davenport Historical Preservation Commission uh, Consulting LLC is a petitioner. A lot to say there. Staff. Okay, so the John F. Kelly Building was built in 1910. Its original use was a wholesale grocery store. So it's a four-story brick structure. Um, it's noted as having simple architecture that lacks detailed ornamentation. And that's really because the focus of this building was on functionality of that warehouse type use. And its significance is that it's associated with the history of commerce in Davenport. Um, so the applicant is, uh, in addition to getting approval from the city, is also seeking financing from uh, state and federal tax programs. Uh, so the following exterior alterations are proposed, and I'll also go through this in more detail on additional slides. Um, so the first being a roof replacement, um, addressing masonry through repointing of mortar, um, as well as applying a, a water coating texture to uh, preserve the masonry, installing metal anchors to permit mounting of temporary floodgates when needed, uh, fire separation at the current east side window opening and the new elevator shaft, installation of additional windows on the west elevation at floors three and four, uh, repairing and repainting existing building signage, and then repairs to a loading dock on the east elevation. So to further break it down, uh, so roof replacement, it's currently a flat roof. It has a parapet wall on the east, west, and north elevations. Um, as you can see on that photo at the bottom, that would be the south elevation. There's no parapet wall on that side. 
Uh, so the applicant's proposing to replace the existing flat roof membrane with a similar roofing material. Uh, the parapet wall has, uh, sections of the wall has a dark bronze parapet metal cap. And then there are other portions that are missing that cap. So the applicant would be installing all new dark bronze <coughs> parapet metal caps along the rooftop. And then there are rooftop mechanical units. Uh, some of them will be installed new and be relocated to the center and north ends of the roof to reduce visibility from the street level. Um, so they would not be visible uh, from ground level or from that south facade that doesn't have the parapet wall. So another project component is to address the masonry. Uh, so the applicant had a complete masonry analysis conducted on the building. Um, that was done really to address the current condition and to address problems with uh, water permeating through the structure. Uh, so that study concluded uh, that the building be examined for the porosity of the brick surface to determine the potential presence of water repellent. Uh, if the exterior brick absorbs water, then a saline water repellent should be first applied. Uh, the debris from the efflorescence inside the structure should be completely removed. Uh, four, to drill small holes into the brick masonry in inconspicuous locations to monitor moisture levels from within the masonry. And then finally five, uh, when there is no evidence of moisture within the masonry, then a moisture barrier uh, saline water repellent can be applied to the interior wall surfaces, uh, which will repel any moisture generated from within the building that may escape through the brick causing damage to the outside. The applicant also had a mortar analysis performed, um, which concluded that the mortar is consisting of lime and sand. So Bi-State Masonry has been contracted to clean and tuck point the building exterior. Um, it looks like that top floor was um, tuck pointed at some point in time, but not the lower level. So this will kind of help clean up that uniform appearance. Um, an additional pro uh, project component is the installation of windows on the third and fourth floor on the west side of the building. So this building is part of a continuous stretch of store frontages and those upper levels are taller than the adjacent structure. So this is being done because new residential units are being added to those upper floors. Uh, so the top shows you the existing west elevation and then that bottom elevation is the proposed. So they are proposing windows that would match the size, appearance and material of the windows on the east elevation. So you can see the last building on the block that's red brick. So it would be that side of the building, just above the adjacent structure. <coughs> um, SHPO recommended, and the applicant is following, that the openings be set back 34 feet from the front elevation. Um, so that'll kind of maintain that current look of the building while still allowing uh, the functional residential units. And then they're showing uh, the proposed aluminum single hung window, which would match those on the east side of the building. And then um, the other project component is signage. Uh, so there's three types of signs on the building. Um, so there's a metal projecting sign on the north elevation along 2nd Street, as well as a wall mounted sign. And then there's two rectangular wall signs with decorative swirls on the east and south elevation. So you could see one that's the south elevation. <coughs> and then this photo, you can see the projecting sign as well as the banner wall sign across the storefront. So the applicant um, is requesting permission to retain the projecting sign and the wall sign on the north elevation to repaint those signs to reflect the new property, which has not yet been determined. And then the applicant is requesting an option to either retain or remove the wall signs on the east and south. Um, if they're retained, they would be repainted to reflect the new name of the building. Um, staff is recommending, just given the uncertainty of the signage at this time, uh, that that be submitted as a separate application if they're going to alter the signage in any manner that 
uh, changes the dimensions, material, illumination, or placement. Uh, so with that, um, a recommendation is made to approve the application um, in accordance with the submitted, submitted material subject to the following condition. And that is that any alteration to the existing <coughs> signage that results in a change in placement, dimension, material, illumination, or other substantial modification requires submission of a separate application for review and approval by the commission. Um, so that condition basically states that they repaint or refurbish their fine, but if they're doing something beyond that, we should probably see it. And then uh, staff reviewed this for conformance with our preservation ordinance, uh, which met four standards. Um, first, just being that they're making a minimum number of changes to maintain the property in good state of repair by addressing some of those water and masonry issues. Um, deteriorated architectural features should be repaired <coughs> and replaced. And that um, new construction and new additions uh, do not destroy the historic material or design if it's compatible with the size, mass, and scale, color, materials, and character of the property. Thank you. Is the petitioner or representative the petitioner would like to address the commission? They may do so. Come to the podium. I think you know how to do it. <laughs> I'm Harry McGinnis. I'm the um, Davenport Historic Preservation Consulting LLC, or appearing to you tonight. I am the consultant on this project. I did want to make one point, and it was a very confusing and long application. The repointing on the fourth floor is absolutely incorrect. It won't say the building will not be repointed to look like the top floor because it's not correct. The original. Uh, but the SHPO was also not requiring us to remove it. It was a, a so well at some point in the past, and I looked through the historic records of of, um, of um, you know permits and things like that. I don't know who, who did this, but they did a concave repointing, maybe because there was water, and it is a recessed. Uh, the correct uh, pointing on the building is the bottom pointing, which is a three eighths inch recess, and so. That's what we'll be doing on the bottom floor. So it will not look the same because the top floor is not right, but we're, we're allowed because it was not done by the, the current owner. So that's the only difference. So I don't have anything else. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Commission, any questions for staff? I'm going to need a recommendation. I'll make a motion that we um, keep the recommendation that's done by staff. Second. A motion and a second uh, to approve staff recommendation with the clarification that the signage is the second shot of the process. Okay. Any, yes. We all good at what we're voting on? Any other questions? Roll call, please. Powers? Yes. Hostetti? Yes. McGivern? Yes. Franken? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Thank you all. <clears throat> Keep doing it. Looks great down there. <clears throat> okay, this takes us to other business, uh, number six. I just will say that um, personally, you know that three of these items, I believe, should be on a work session. But um, administration and staff wants us to go this way, and I think that's fine. But my, my preference on some of this long-term scope stuff is work sessions are the most appropriate place for it. But uh, that being said, um, we will go to uh, item number A, which is the Historic Preservation Commission training. So thanks for having me. I, I came to the last meeting and kind of sensed a little bit. Um, there were some questions and some confusion, and hopefully this will clear up some of the issues on the work session versus a normal meeting as well. Nicole, um, would you introduce oh, yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. Nicole Gleason. I am the public works director and assistant city administrator um, for the city of Davenport. So, um, yep. 
So some of this, I'm just gonna kind of fly through. This is um, basically a, a base presentation that we use to train a lot of boards and commissions. So it kind of starts at the beginning. And then going forward, as you do have new commissioners, Laura and Matt will be able to run through this with them so that when they start, everyone's kind of starting from the same base of information. So obviously, as you know, we're a mayor council form of government. So the meetings at the city council run similar to this where the mayor presides but does not have a vote. Um, he does have veto power and then he does have the authority for appointing um, boards and commissions. And um, as you may have noticed during the COVID emergency, he does have power to declare an emergency um, in the city, therefore triggering special actions in, in those times. And then the council um, is a majority quorum. There so six of the 10 have to be present to vote. Um, and then any time six of them are going to be together, it needs to be a posted public meeting. Um, and they can only act by motion, resolution, or ordinance and make all the policy decisions. So they set the policy level for staff to kind of administer the budget. Um, and that budget was just on our last city council meeting. And then Corey Spiegel is our city administrator. She's my boss, so she really runs the day-to-day -day operations with that policy um, information we just mentioned and um, really looks over all the various city services, makes you know us, her staff, and her you know make those recommendations to council if we feel there needs to be a different policy direction or budgetary direction based on how the business <coughs> is running. And um, there are 13 departments, and we all attend city council on a regular basis. We hope every Wednesday is city council, two Tuesdays a month, we do a management, it's called a management mayor council update. And then occasionally there are work sessions. Again, those are posted to the public and public meetings, um, but the, during those meetings, public is not allowed to comment. And then we obviously have the majority of that citizen contact as a staff. So from a legal and ethical issue, the state of Iowa has a very strict law on gifts. So this applies to city council members, commissioners, and staff. So um, it's $299. No one's allowed to accept anything that would be considered greater than $299. So basically, like, you can take a pen, I guess. Um, if you're ever not sure, you can ask the legal department. Um, or if you feel like something's happened where it, it feels... You're, like you're in a gray area, um, never, never hesitate to, to reach out to Laura or our legal department with questions. Uh, conflicts of interest. So this includes commissioners as well. If you have a job or interest that's in direct conflict or provides a monetary service to the city, um, we're no longer able to have you as a commissioner. So just you have to make sure that if you do end up thinking you may would have a conflict of interest just to disclose that and let legal know. Um, I do believe we can do up to like $3,000 a year worth of business or something like that. It's pretty de minimis, um, but anything, it still has to be disclosed, but then anything beyond that would potentially um, restrict a membership on a commission. So, um, I guess I kind of already said that, but if you do have questions on that, we do have a, a city's uh, standard operating procedure or we can ask legal as well. And then an open meetings law is the gathering. So basically what we're doing here. So anytime, um, if your commission is seven, anytime four or more of you are together and intending to talk about anything related to historic preservation, um, that does have to be posted within 24 hours and available to the public. And um, obviously, if, if you don't have a quorum and you do have a meeting where something needs to be voted on, the meeting would have to be canceled. You wouldn't be able to do any voting related business without uh, four members present. And then the only time you can have a closed session is if it's related to litigation. Um, so if it's like an attorney client privilege, so for whatever reason, if the commission was going to be sued, which I can't imagine that happening, that would be the only really time you'd be able to have a closed session that's not recorded. Um, so if you do have a question about that, I think if that case ever happened, obviously legal would be proactively reaching out to you guys. 
Um, and to have a closed session, so in city council meetings, if they are gonna discuss litigation, they have to take a roll call. Um, and then Tom Warner, the city attorney, still has to keep minutes. Um, they, that meeting doesn't have to be recorded, but minutes, like a time of commencement, a time of adjournment, all of that still needs to be taking place. And if there is a closed session that's inappropriate, um, the city and the commission could be fined, um, and my understanding is fined individually. So a work session is generally um, a purpose of focusing on a single topic. For city council, because those meetings tend to be kind of long, they generally hold them on a different day. So think of our budget work sessions maybe on a Saturday. Um, if they know they're going to have a short meeting, we have had a work session during a normal um, like Tuesday management update before. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, if you want a work session on a different day, I guess you guys could, you'd probably have to work amongst yourself and staff to make sure that the room is available, the recording materials available, all of that, because it's still subject to the same rules and posting guidelines. Um, but when you're having a short meeting, I would say the majority of our commissions run their work session on the same day as their normal meetings because their meetings aren't generally as lengthy um, as the city council and quite frankly, they're smaller groups. So with city council with 11 people, um, those meetings tend to get a little bit longer than we have with some of our smaller commissions. Um, so it's still subject to the same open meetings laws and required to have the 24 hour posting. Um, and then in your current bylaws, it, it does state that it's specifically for demolition, but it's not really how it's commonly used. Um, and per my conversations with Laura and Matt, you guys are talking about suggestions for bylaw updates, and, and that's one of the things we would look at modifying. And then the purpose of other business would potentially be something where you want to discuss it in this open meeting format, but it's not quite prepared for a vote yet. Um, so, you know, I, I think you guys have had different uh, presenters or different people who've had questions, but they're not quite ready to fill out their application. So that, all of that's perfectly fine, um, how you've been running it for your other business. And then is that the last one? Oh, okay. And then, um, so this is open records laws. So I don't know if you're all uh, familiar with the term FOIA, that's Freedom of Information Act. So anytime um, you're doing commission business, if someone were to submit a FOIA to the city of Davenport, um, you would be subject to those same rules of disclosing emails, um, any meeting records, things like that in relation to that uh, FOIA request. So um, your bylaws are really kind of what you have a little bit more control over. So it's kind of how you guys function administratively. Your current version is still perfectly fine. We do understand that the zoning updates did cause reference errors. However, um, that's really looked at by our city legal as a Scrivener error. Um, Laura's been noting those as we've encountered them. Your bylaws are still fine as they stand, but obviously once you do take action to update your bylaws, we would run um, all of those kind of Scrivener error updates through council as well to make sure that everything's ticked and tied and accurate as whatever at whatever time you guys make those revisions. Um, and then I know that um, Matt and Laura have a, one of your items was kind of outlining their proposed timeline for that bylaw update. And just so you know, um, once you guys have your recommendation, generally how that works is they would create a marked up version tracking changes. Once you're all comfortable with that version, we would still have to have it reviewed by our city legal department to make sure that um, there's nothing we're doing that's out of bounds. And then once that's approved, um, you guys would adopt it and then we would start setting up a follow-up um, ordinance update through council to update those reference errors. So did I miss anything, Laura? No. And then, um, I also attend every month the Civil Service Commission, and, and these seem to be similar to the elections. So they, every year, usually in their first meeting of January, they, they basically kind of draw straws, I guess, um, and, and say who does or doesn't want to be eligible, and then they, they basically make a motion and an I um, to elect 
um, an annual officer. So if as you guys give your feedback to, to Laura and Matt on how you want to do that for your co commission, I would say it's generally a very informal process from what I've seen in all of the other commissions. So I, I wanted to go through that fast because I didn't. I know most of that is probably not new information to you, but I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Okay. Um, and Patricia, is Nicole or Miss Cleese? Nicole's perfectly Nicole. fine. Thank yes. You, Nicole. So Nicole, on the the just the brief of city government, and we've had this before. But new commissioners. It's always good to have. <clears throat> the um, in, in regards to the um, the. Uh, the uh, work sessions and how they're right now they're kind of tailored for demolition, but that's not always been the way they've been used. This is a working commission, um, and it's a commission that's continually learning. New members come. There's always new issues, just like with Des Moines that came through. My concern, as we modify the bylaws, is that we have a forum recorded or whatever, away from the structured people's business, which was just before us, where we can be in a more comfortable setting and learn. It's hard to learn up here. You know, when you're on the city council, you have a great deal of lead time on issues. You have a great deal of administration and staffing that gives you the information before, from what's my experience. Here, it's a working group, and we kind of work together over the issues. And the main setting of the meeting itself isn't always structured for that. And that's, when we deal with these bylaws, it's, I want to make sure that we don't lose the flavor of the learning part of a work session because it, it's helpful for the future commission members because we are a, a working group. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's not this group, if it would be design and review, whatever the future of historic preservation may be, um, yeah, I think we do need that venue, may not be like city council, but still legal with open meetings where we can work through issues so we can serve the public. Does that make sense? It does, and I would say that a lot of times, if you've come to city council meetings, when they're in a work session format, they will actually all move to the table. Exactly. So they're more in that kind of round, like like you said, more of a meeting style, which is perfectly fine. Or if you think this venue isn't appropriate, we've held um, work session type meetings at the libraries, um, places like that, which is was also perfectly fine. Um, I guess I think just from um, a scheduling perspective, you're all available at this time. And, and I, we found it very difficult to, to find availability, especially um, on a lot of our commissions, if, if people still work um, outside of their role as yeah, a commissioner. Yeah. And in work sessions still, we have the video and everything, it's still recorded, yep. as I understand, yep. just not um, distributed, unless requested. Correct, yep, and we would keep it for that specific FOIA purpose that I mentioned Absolutely. previously. Yep, so Absolutely. in the case here, like if you did wanna break into work session, um, we would just, we would declare that, and then we could let Jerry, our communication specialist, know, hey, at, you know, whatever time it is, at 545, we broke from the regular meeting and went into the work session, um, so she could post the meeting up till 545, and then we could certainly split off the work session piece um, as a separate video. Like, that's no issue. And, and the great positive, from my perspective, on work sessions is you can learn, but then you're not forced to take action, because you can't take action in a work session, you can take action, as I understand it, in the next following published meeting. Correct. So yep. it, it makes good governance, I think, and, and, and a smart decision-making on the commission's perspective. And that's, it's just my perspective, so you understand that? No, 100%, and I, I agree with you. I think a lot of it just comes down um, to scheduling. I understand. Um, you know, especially with, with staff expectations at other council meetings throughout the Thank week. You. So just we'd have to probably have some lead time to make sure that ev the, everyone's available. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other commissioners got a question? Uh, Want to go down here, Karen? No, Christine. I concur with you completely. Okay, uh, Diane. Yes, I concur, absolutely. But I would request that we each get a copy of what you just put on the screen. Absolutely, happy to do that. Yep. Thank you. Do you have anything else, Dan? No. Okay, Michael. Yes, I. I'm the newbie <coughs> up here, yeah. and um, I almost said something this evening uh, under case A. I had a question about the way that is handled. Clearly, everything is appropriate, but it seemed to me from the description that, that uh, Matt gave us 
they weren't really substantively changing that house at all. In fact, they are maintaining that house. They are restoring that house. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, well, why does that have to come to us at all? They're not altering it. They're not, they're not messing the house up in any way, shape, or form. But I thought, no, I really can't ask that question because we're just saying you do it or not. And, and I think because I do need to learn about these things, um, having an opportunity for work sessions to talk about those issues really would be helpful, for, especially for those of us who are new to this. Right. So um, you could always ask us if, if you have a question before the meeting even or during the meeting. It's totally appropriate for you to ask um, or make that comment. Um, I, I do want to be cognizant of making sure we're, we're not delaying actions. I, I know that we, uh, to a certain extent, it's been brought up about being business friendly and proactive as well. So um, I just want to be cognizant of that. We don't drag things out too long and um, in, in doing uh, too many work sessions. We only do meet once a month. Right. So it's something that we need to be sensitive to. Um, <clears throat> but we're, we're here to answer questions. We're happy to answer your questions related to that. Um, the reason that I will answer your question now, the re reason it's brought to you is because according to the code, um, when an item's changed material, so it's the physical material in addition to it, it's triggered. So if it requires a building permit, it comes to you. We don't have anything in our code at this time that does any kind of administrative approvals. So that's why they do come to you. Okay, from, from what you're saying though, Laura, should I be asking my questions after I've read the, the materials that Matt sends out before this meeting occurs? Do I send you an email saying, I'm not quite sure about this. Am I concerned about that? Or do I save my questions for the evening when we're all here together? So I would say, um, as a new commissioner, if you want to directly email Matt and he can reply, that's fine. Um, the only thing I would caution you against is you, ca you can't copy all the commissioners because then it becomes an open meetings violation because you're basically meeting via email. Um, if it's a one-off question and you send it to him and he thinks it's appropriate to share with all the commissioners, he could certainly add it to his presentation um, and share it in the meeting as well. So, but if asking during the meeting is appropriate um, or if, if you think of it right when you see the agenda and you wanna drop an, an email and understand better as a learning commissioner, that's perfectly appropriate as well. Okay, so yeah. if I hear you, what you're saying is when I, review the agenda. Yep. If I have questions, I can shoot them to Matt, mm -hmm. just Matt. He will either address it by return email or address it in the presentation that the staff provides. Correct. Correct. All right, and then if I need clarification, I can then ask for the meeting. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. But I don't talk to these guys. Okay. You can talk, I mean, and there's nothing talk. that, if you talk one-on-one, -on -one, that's perfectly fine. The only other thing is being a conduit. So you can't, you know, Bob can't call each of you and say, oh, Michael said this, Diane said that, like that's called a conduit. But if you, if you, if you, you know, Bob's like, hey, I want to, you know, bounce this off of someone, like he, he certainly can. Um, so th that's just what you have to be sensitive to is, is when there's a quorum of you that are now kind of having the same conversation individually and sharing each other's opinions to get around having a meeting. And that's what generally we, um, we, we don't recommend emails because they're easily forwarded, which is an automatic conduit situation. So um, that's, um, that's why we handle it that way. Um, we don't want you to accidentally have a, an open meetings violation. I, I got, I'm sorry. Wait, I've never heard this word second. conduit before. Okay. One second here. Okay. I want to make sure I stay. Did you get your questions answered? Yes, and, okay. and we'll see how much I screw it up in the next time. You'll be, you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay, right. we'll see. Uh, Christine. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is, and I know I'm not alone in this, that we need a way to be able to communicate with each other, not necessarily up here. And the whole work session thing and this conduit thing, I mean, we were told if we emailed four people, then it was open meetings, but if we emailed everybody one-on-one, -on -one, then it wasn't a violation. Now you're saying it's a conduit issue. No, it would only be a conduit if you sent the same email to each of them. And then when they replied to you, you took all of their replies, forward them back to everybody. 
So you're basically skirting the, the open meetings law by sharing, like, so you call Bob and then tell Karen what Bob said, and then you call Diane and tell Diane what Karen and Bob said, like you can't, like a domino basically. So if you just have a conversation with Bob about something and that's all that does, you're fine. It's once you start involving everyone in the same conversation and playing the telephone game, that, that's where you become a conduit. Okay. Yep. Thanks for the clarification. I sure. just, I just really strongly would like an opportunity for us to be able to talk and communicate with each other on some level. Not necessarily during this time because we're here for the people's business, but we all have things to learn and share. And that's why I think the work sessions can be very important. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Any other questions? My perspective, and it's just, I know the way the council communicates now probably has changed over 20 years from where it is now. Always communicating with your fellow co-workers, responsible uh, folks, real life can be a challenge, right? Which is why I always thought the work sessions worked out well, because one, there's oversight, but you can have this general talk and legal's there to get you out of the way if we make a long term. Um, and that's because this is really a learning, uh, working commission. And it, work sessions, I do not believe, have to be every time. And I always think they could follow shortly after any meeting. Uh, and we know what's coming up in the next two months. It's just, I don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater out, so to speak, as and we do these bylaws. And that's my only concern. 100%, nope, and, I, and you guys will have 100% capability, like once they have, once they get all your feedback and incorporate it into those bylaws, you know, you will see a red line version, be able to provide additional feedback okay. um, to that. And then, yep, and like I said, in, in if your hesitation of having a work session is, you know, it's okay to do it the same day and take a five minute break and move to the table or, you know, whatever, um, as long as we know in advance to, to, so we can still have the recording material. Perfect. Yep. Christine, you have a follow up. I have a question. Yes. Why is it that the staff and administration felt it was necessary to go over these items during the regular commission meeting? I, I agree with him. I think clearly this could have been a work session and not make the public have to wait and go through all of this. Oh, I guess that's why we did it after the public portion. I don't think so. Oh, I apologize. Okay. I, so, yeah, if we wanted, we could certainly do that first. I, I apologize. That was an oversight on my part. New item? Oh, okay. So we're going to do it. All right. No, we'll find we're going to stick with the agenda. Is there anything else on item number A, Historic Preservation Commission, from the commission's perspective? Yes, I have a puzzlement. We just recently found out that uh, work sessions were recorded. No one ever told me that. I never knew it, and I'm not the only one. So since so I... They, I'd like to know why they are recorded and who watches them and how long they stay as a record. So um, the record retention policy, I'd have to follow up with the library. In general, things are five to seven years, I would say. Um, so since we've upgraded the AV equipment, um, every commission meeting since then, so it's probably been 2019-ish, um, as long as it's a quorum meeting that's open to the public, has been recorded. I'm not saying it shouldn't be okay. recorded. I'm saying, why do none of us, did none of us know about that? That should be like, that's more than, more than a courtesy to let people know that. And I, I apologize, I guess, with the board on, when you're onboarded onto a border commission, you know, if you're not told that at that time, it, that was just my assumption that that's part of, like, when you sign up for a border commission, it's a public, it's a quasi-judicial public position, and, and that's just, I think, a kind of normal these days. So we can certainly make sure Tiffany understands that as part of the, when someone signs up to be a commissioner, that that's the expectation. But it's also... Um, the fact has surfaced that as far as preparation for a new uh, council person, commissioner, there, there really hasn't been orientation. Correct. And that's, that's kind of, that's incorrect. Oh, Actually, so we do an orientation for all the new commissioners. I'm speaking for myself, Laura. Okay. When I came on board, there was nothing, to, no preparation at all. You just sat there. You listened and you opened your ears and you noted that the, the way the procedure was, but I, and I'm not alone. But you've so. been on the commission for how many years? 
forever. Diane. Right, I know. And so I know that part of Corey's endeavor, I know it as has been kind of, you know, with, with you know, Matt and Laura and with, with the other commissioners is making sure when we do get a new member that they at least get a basic orientation. Um, and then as we get new tools such as this to include with that orientation, um, certainly can share those reading materials as well. That's wonderful. You know, one of the things that I think it, I would advise you all to think about is uh, the commission has turned over quite regularly. And part of that is not knowing and wanting to be doing it the way it's supposed to be done. And people were just not, they were learning from each other. So it's, it's a long-term, there, long, there were long-term effects from that. Well, and that's why we thought it was worthwhile to oh, do this presentation. I only so. wish it had okay. come quite a while ago. Um, does this uh, cover the any questions from the commission on the Historic Preservation Commission training oversight? All right, and we've touched on the other ones, but I'm going to go down the line here. Item number B, which is the timeline for updating the commission bylaws. Okay, so on the board, and then I also printed off materials at each one of your stations, is uh, just the proposed timeline for updating our bylaws. Uh, so at this meeting, we've distributed our bylaws that are existing. Uh, so now everyone has the bylaws and the relevant code sections. So over the course of between this meeting and our June meeting, staff is going to make edits, find all those code sections that are not referenced and address some of those issues. So that way at our June meeting, we'll provide a draft copy um, that we'll also review with the legal department for the commission uh, to review, provide comments and submit uh, recommendations. Uh, those can be further revised by staff and reviewed with the legal department for a potential vote at our July meeting. Um, if more edits are warranted or uh, deemed necessary by the commission, uh, we'll continue to make those edits and review them until we have a set of bylaws that the commission is happy with. And it is my complete understanding that it's the commission that recommends to the council the approval of the bylaws or how's that? Council never sees your bylaws, it's so us. it's just you. Okay. Right, the, the reference to council was once your bylaws are updated, making sure all the references in the zoning code are accurate. And I think we all agree in this room, it's all of our responsibility is to have the best bylaws possible. Perfect. Is there anyone from the commission? I'm gonna start right down and I'm just gonna keep going, but I'll start with Michael and go this way. Michael, do you have any questions on this item for staff? No, this is good. I'm glad to see you talking. Diane? No. Christine? Yes, I do. Um, I still would like clarification, Nicole. I think we talked about this at the last meeting. I think you might've said you were gonna check on it, is whether the chapter uh, I believe it's 1723050. Is, is it removed? Is it not removed about the power of the and duty of the commission to adopt its own administrative procedural guidelines? So that piece was transferred into section 2.65. So the administrative and procedural guidelines is found as number A under that section of, of powers. So, and, uh, so do we have our powers to set our own procedures then? Or I'm still not clear. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. So I think. Brian Krupp confirmed that that 2.65 is basically the same as okay. what it was before. It's just a reference error from the zoning code update. So that's what we'll follow on to fix once you adopt your new yep. bylaws. In, in okay. front of you, thank you, Matt did provide the old code sections for your reference. So the the powers and duties. So 1723.050 was transferred over to um, section or chapter 2.65 in the city code. Right here, yep. It's the second page of the of the old one. Do you have a question? More on that? Karen? Okay. Let me stay organized here. So the staff member who um, redid bylaws recently for the zoning board of the county. I'll let you come up here and speak. And then to um Introduce yourself. I know. Scott Copes, uh, Department of DNS. Um, I've recently done bylaws update for the Zoning Board of Adjustment, and it was a major overhaul, and we followed 
legal's guidelines when we did that. But one thing to note for how we did it is we didn't have the strike through because it was completely new. So we didn't really have an ability to do that. So I don't know if that's going to happen in your case or not, but it might be something that happens. So. But I did highlight the new substantive changes. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Again, we kind of gone over this a little bit. This is item number C, work session, election procedures and bylaws. And I was just gonna mention if, if you as a um, commission would like to substitute your open forum first so that your guests can leave, you're welcome to do that um, at this time. That, that's up to you though. And we're just gonna finish this up. Okay. Um, so work session, election procedures and bylaws, if you just wanna summarize or is there, we kind of already covered it, I think. Oh, I guess I, did, I didn't know if you actually wanted to break into a work session at this meeting or if you wanted to wait and schedule that at a future time. I'm gonna jump in here, is that, is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. um, I passed out a sheet at the last meeting. I was planning to have a work session, which did not happen. But I went ahead and flat, passed it out just with some ideas and recommendations that I had on the election. And I just hope that the commissioners had a chance to look it over and at some point maybe we can say yay or nay or I would like to make a motion on it at some point, but I'd like to be able to hear from everyone, you know, what they're thinking about it. I don't know that this is the right time to do it. I don't, I again, I thought we were having a work session, so what? I'm just confused. So, so when Matt put this on the agenda, that was the intent. That is, if you wanted to break into work session today, we could do that. But if you prefer not to, um, we could certainly send out a doodle poll with some questions on times and set up a specific work session date. I would, I guess, leave that up to you and be respectful of your time and what you want to do. I'm going to go into work session. I don't care. Uh, I mean, let's go ahead and just we'll do the work session after this real quick. Okay. Fair. We'll spend 10 minutes after this on this item. Yeah, yeah if you want to go ahead and finish out the agenda, yep, we can good. close and that. We'll and then skip over yep, to, uh, is fine. that okay with the yep. commission? Perfect. All right. This takes us to item number D, 2023 Quad Cities Henry Farnham Dinner. And I know this came from, I believe, Michael. Um, so, Michael, is there anything you want to add to this? Or we kind of threw this up, as I recall. Is there anything from staff first on this? Um, no, just that Michael brought to uh, our attention the Quad Cities Henry Farnham dinner, um, which is uh, up on the screen. So it's Thursday, April 20th uh, at Valley's Casino and Hotel in Rock Island. Uh, they do have opportunities for organizations to set up a table to present, um, I think, just information. Uh, so, I don't know, Michael, if there's anything that you would like to add, if this well, commission wanted to do a table, if you just want to attend. Um, Yes, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, of course, everyone is welcome, right? But, but when I heard that we were going to have these tables, information tables, and they're free, I thought, hey, maybe the commission, if, if we've done this in the past for, for public information, and Diane had mentioned that we do some initiatives, we had done educational initiatives, I thought, well, I'll bring it up to us. I, I wasn't in any way trying to... Um, corral us into something that we wouldn't normally be doing, but I thought, well, this was an opportunity. And if we miss it this year, there will be a dinner again next year. So, you know, that's all I was getting at. <clears throat> any other commissioners have any uh, thoughts on this? What I would suggest, uh, you've, I've always pushed action. I think action with the commission and out in the public is a good thing. I don't know if I will be attending the dinner or not. So let's see if we can get two volunteers from the commission that would like to do this. And if so, I will help with staff and the resources to make sure that we have this done. And if not, then we'll look at next year. Okay. Okay, this takes us to, uh, is there anything else on this other business that I've missed? Commission? All right, this takes us to open forum for comment. Patient young lady, come on up. Well, I actually tried to come last Tuesday to the Park and Rec Commission meeting, but Historic Preservation, the Park and... I am Jane, I do X. I live at 2111 East Lombard Street in Davenport. And I grew up in the third ward of Davenport. In fact, um, my first experience with city council was when my dad got elected to the third ward when I was eight years old. And we practice Robert's Rules of Order in the dinner table. 
Anyway, um, so it came to my attention, and I apologize that I didn't learn this at the time that it was happening, though I was somewhat aware by driving past. But to give you a little bit more background, I mean, I grew up on the corner of 8th and Taylor Street in Davenport. Um, my parents moved there in the mid-1950s and lived there until about 1996-97. That basically is one and a half blocks, a very long block, down the hill from what I grew up calling Lookout Park. It's part of the historic preservation, um, now on the National Historic Preservation. At the time I was growing up, it, it wasn't, but... It was the park that we walked up the hill to and picnicked on the wall. It was the park that we walked up the hill to and rode down the grass and hung out underneath what they called the bicennial tree and pretend it was our little horses with roots stuck out of the ground. It was the park that we drove up the hill to each and every fireworks display down on the levee in our parents' station wagon loaded. My parents had 11 kids. Loaded all the kids, sometimes neighbor kids, you know, blah, blah, blah into the station wagon to go and park along the limestone wall and watch the fireworks. Our parents stayed in the car. You know, I had a handicapped sister that often stayed in the car. We sat on the wall, the, the, the hillside, waiting for the fireworks display to happen. No longer can do that. And I grew up down the hill from that park before the house on the corner of Washington and Clay was built. The Bishop of Davenport still lived directly across the street from the park when I grew up. Um, you know, was where that some Catholic and blah blah blah. We, my school in fourth grade, our nun, we went. My teacher, we walked up to that park three blocks from St. Mary's Catholic School and Church on Sixth and Fillmore. You know, up the big long Fillmore Street Hill, um, and. So the house that's on the corner, right across the street from the entrance of the park, on the west side leading into Mary Crest College, you know, um, that house wasn't there. I, I don't know what year it was built. I, I'd be happy to do the research, so I'm sure that you guys could do it easier. Also, I don't believe that who had it built is the current owner. Now, I happen to, to follow this fellow down Washington Street, uh, that, his driveway on, at the corner there. And I followed him into his driveway, and I got out and said, hey, can I talk to you about the park across the street? He said, sure. And I said, um, what do you think about, you know, the park being, the interest is being closed off? He says, oh, I love it. And I said, oh, I'm really disappointed because everything I just said to you. And I said, so if I wanted to bring my family over to watch the fireworks, where are we supposed to park? Your driveway? Of course, he said no. And then he said, we have nothing further to talk about. I can't change your mind. You can't change mine. But he bought that house knowing full well that he lived across the street from a historical park, a park that's been here since the 1800s, is that correct? And if it's not going to be used for the purpose that the original people bought that land, donated that land to the city of Davenport, and honored the historic preservation of that park or anything, tear the damn sign down. You know, one of our esteemed city council members that's very into historic preservation, and I love her for that, she and I had a real good hour and a half conversation recently about it. He's the third ward, the council member. Um, she said, if we were going to acquire a park today, we wouldn't acquire one so small. Thank God she wasn't part of the group accepting that land back in the 1800s because that park was established for the city of Davenport and all of its residents to have a great view of the river. Now, the people that live right at the bottom of that park on 10th Street, well, they have to walk up the hill to be able to see the view, to see the fireworks, to picnic on the wall as 10-year-olds. It's not fair that that park is now only for the people that live across the street from the park and down Clay Street up towards Mary Crest College. Everybody that's moved into that park, and I can bet you anything, it's all people that have lived there since I grew up, and I'm 65 years old. They all knew they were moving in across the street from a park. It should not be their private park. There's no place to park on Clay Street. There's no place to park on Washington Street. There's certainly no place to park on Fillmore Street Hill, right? And I understand that the park and rec people or whomever want to dig into the side of the earth, not taking the house that's on the west side of the drive of the park to put in maybe five or six parking spots. Lovely. My sister, my oldest sister, she's 82, 81. She got married in the gazebo. Now, that was just added sometime in the 1980s, 
Lovely. But, you know, my big family, where were they going to park to go to a wedding in the gazebo today? You know, where was my 80-year-old mother supposed to park and walk? In those five little spots, that my family of 11 with all of the grandchildren, blah, wouldn't fit in that five spaces that you're thinking about digging into the side of the hill. Take the rocks out. Let people enjoy the park as it was historically preserved for the city of Davenport, all residents. What do I need to do to make that happen? What do you need to do to make that happen? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Your dad was a good man. Thanks, Bob. I've got a Duex and a Finley bumper sticker in my garage. I still what have I'm... Duex bumper stickers, signs, yada, 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 and yeah. Finley fingernail files. and Duex and <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, okay, is there any uh, other public open with foreign comment? Uh, if not, um, we have our next commission meeting, May 9th, 2023. We will make a motion to adjourn into a work session. Uh, roll call for adjournment. Franken? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Powers? Yes. Vestetti? Yes. Mickey Yes. Oh, let's go down and take a chill, Do you need a break? No, I'll, I, I just, hopefully, hopefully.